Are you hungry for a lasting relationship? Are you thirsty for the drink that never runs out? Are you tired of television that numbs the mind and distorts the truth? Well, hunger, thirst, and tire no more. Get ready for an exciting new culture in media. Shalom World, a global Catholic television network, is now joining hands with the church in Ireland, the land of saints and scholars. A nation which was brought alive by the flame of faith, ignited long ago by St. Patrick, and spread throughout the far corners of the world through the many missionaries that left its shores. Rise up, join hands. Let's once again take up the challenge. You're called to be a light to the whole wide world. A 24-7, high-definition, commercial-free, Catholic family channel, Shalom World invites Ireland into a deeper experience with Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and his church. A marvelous tool to deepen the evangelization and the spreading of the good news around our country. Endorsed by Catholic leaders from around the world. Helping people to encounter Jesus on their own road. Shalom World is redefining the meaning of entertainment changing media to heal your past, guide your present, and shape your future. Shalom World features vibrant programs designed for the whole family, including daily mass, Eucharistic adoration, talk shows, hold your God, powerful preaching, transform your life, youth and young adult conferences, children's programs, movies, music, Bible studies, interviews, live papal visits, and much more. Joyfully be! And guess what? It's absolutely free. Change what you watch, and watch the world change. Celebrate life with Shalom World, God's own channel. Good morning and welcome to Radio Maria Ireland. Father Eamon McCarthy with you here, the priest director. It's lovely to have your companionship here with me. Today is a very special day, the 1st of November, the Feast of All Saints. And I'd like to tell you a story. A Dublin man who uh, traveled the streets of the city and lived in the streets of the city really in within about a square mile of the city uh, for most or all of his life and reached out to the poor. He was to be seen on his bicycle, morning, noon and night around the city and just beautiful weather like we have today indeed. And no doubt uh, this gentleman enjoying that as well, but sharing not just the light of God's grace and the beauty of nature, but the grace of God through the sacraments, through faith, through particularly his outreach to the poor. Uh, he was well known indeed and loved by so many and had a great zeal for the salvation of souls. The influence of his life spread throughout the whole world and he is well known even today. He'd be raised to the altars as an example to all of us to go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. I'm speaking of none other than, of course, known to many of us here in Ireland and around the world, Frank Duff.
And in Dublin in the 1910s, a very poor city, people living in tenement situations, terrible squalor, no social welfare, no assistance from the state, nothing. Uh, and Ireland was in transition from English occupation through to uh, Irish independence. A lot of stuff going on. The First World War, of course, in the 1910s. Um, a lot of difficulties there. Ireland was a very poor country. In those days, we had the Great Famine in 1847. Where a million people died. I don't remember a million people in our small country died of hunger or the diseases that came with undernourishment. And then over a million emigrated to the United States, to Australia, to New Zealand, to England, Scotland, all over the, the English-speaking world, and some also to Central Europe. So it was a devastating time in Ireland of poverty, socio-economic deprivation. And that's the background. Uh, the Vincent de Paul was a lay organization that tried to meet the dire needs of people at that time, families and so on. Frank got involved in that and was a tremendous member of the St. Vincent de Paul. He was the eldest of seven children and he was very devoted to his mother and father and the whole family. His family experience was very profound, really profound effect on him. Like two or three of his siblings died, he was very, very young. Frank would be at their deathbeds. In fact, all the children died more or less in his arms, so to speak. Certainly he was present, the same with his parents. And I think that this had a profound effect on Frank. Frank Duff himself was, was a lay man. I know Pope St. John Paul was always very conscious, Pope Francis maybe too, of elevating the laity in terms of potential for canonization. But Frank Duff was, a, was an ordinary layman. He had no theological qualifications. He would say, even growing up in his house in, in Dublin, that they, there was no special charism or spirituality. They fulfilled their duties as far as Catholicism was concerned. A man, a young man, in his mid-twenties, his spiritual life, first of all, he was a deadly masco. One Lent, he decided to go to Mass every day for Lent. And after Lent, he continued it on for the rest of his life, sometimes two Masses every day. So that was the Mass. He had an extraordinary devotion to the Eucharist. Then he took on at the same time, around this, roughly the same time in his 20s, the Divine Office. In, 19, in the 19, 14, 17, that period, lay people didn't pray the Divine Office, but Frank did, and he prayed the whole Divine Office in Latin. And it wasn't until he was 24 years of age, in the year 1913, a friend, again, here's the personal approach, the personal contact, the lay apostolate, reaching out to somebody, invited him to join the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which is a simple organization for men only at the time, but caring for the poor in the city. But one of the things that happened during that, he began to see that it wasn't just the material needs that was a big problem. They were a big problem. Poverty was a big problem. But he began to see the spiritual destitution of a lot of people, that very often extreme poverty brings in problems like drink and other ways of trying to cope with des in desperation. And that was the situation when he was a member of the Vincent de Paul. He was deeply affected by his experience of family life, um, poverty and families. So many families living in one room and maybe just one ex external toilet for a whole block of flats and so on, so. 
Uh, but from there, and because of Frank's work with the St. Vincent de Paul Society and all his visitation that he was doing of these tenement areas around the city, he happened one day upon uh, a, a brothel or a house of prostitution. And he said his initial reaction when he realized where he was, was to just back out and, and, and run. Monta was the biggest uh, red light district in, in Europe at one stage. Monta's not a big area, it's less than a square mile. But in that square mile, it's estimated that 1,600 women would have operated in that area. They, the people that came into Monta would have been from the lowest, from the street cleaners to the king. This place was so rough and so unapproachable that the clergy weren't going anywhere near this place. The police certainly weren't going either because they said, look, it's, it's a contained place of vice. There's illegal alcohol. There's a lot of uh, pimping going on, as we call it nowadays, prostitution. It, everything of, it's of a seedy nature was, was active here, and these poor girls were drawn into this horrible life of vice and destruction, self-destruction. Monto, a very famous red light area in Dublin. A very famous part, once written about by James Joyce. James Joyce called it Night Town. This place was right behind the main street in O'Connell Street in Dublin. This wasn't something he was prepared for. Um, but he, he, you know, he re-engaged his, his thinking process. Look, these are poor street guards who are forced into this way of life because they're so poor. We need to do something about this. He was on a mission for the St. Vincent de Paul on the south side of the city. And he went into this house by mistake. And when he went into the house, he found there was a group of women. And he suddenly quickly realized they were prostitutes and they were selling themselves. So Frank was a bit disturbed about it. So he went off and got the local priest and he asked the local priest to come down and to talk to these women. And the priest said, what can I say to them? You know, so Frank Tuff said, well, you go down and talk to them and see what happens. So the priest went down and he had a few words with them. And all the priest could say to these women was, will you stop what you are doing? It's an offense to God. And the women said, sure, if you stop what we're doing, how are we going to live? How are we going to survive? Where are we going to be? So then Frank Duff decided, hang on. He said, if I get a place for you to come to where I can t we can talk to you in a nice environment, would we'll you just come? And all the women said yes. Frank Duff then went around the local convents and he asked the nuns, could they uh, allow him to bring these women into the convents so he could talk to them in a nice environment and try and get them to change their ways. And the nuns said no. Frank Tupp was in the middle of that, and he was trying to help these women. He went out, out to the convent in Val Dyle, and it was there that, that, that he met the Amer American nun called Mother, Mother Angela Walsh. And she welcomed them in, and she allows Frank Tuff then to bring the, the women into the convent. And it was there that Frank Tuff brought those women into the convent in Val Dyle, and he spent, I think, a number of days with them. And then the women said, at the final end, well, OK, we're willing to change our ways. But where are we going to go? Where are we going to live, Mr. Duff? So they had a point. So Frank Duff went to see then the, the what you call the, the minister in the local government, a man called W.T. Cosgrave. Well, I give him a letter from Mr. Cosgrave's handwriting, informing us that the premises number 76 Hawkwood Street had been placed at our disposal free of rental rates for a period of three months. So he wrote out a check for 50 pounds to Frank Duff. And then he said, come back tomorrow and I'll see what else I can do. So when they went back the next day, he gave them the keys of number 76 Harker Street, this building here. You can have that building uh, for three months, rent free, the whole lot. And out of 50 pounds that, that, that W.T. Cosgrave had given, they went off and bought beds in secondhand shops and cleaned out the building and they opened up what was become the first Sancta Maria Hostel for prostitutes. And the crowning moment of the end of the story is the consecration to that whole area to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. They put up a picture and a crucifix and just changed the entire district area, completely turned it around. Monto was officially closed up. So they organized a big 
procession, a big march down into Monto. So hundreds of people gathered outside the pro Cathedral Church in, in, uh, in Marlborough Street. And there's a man by the name of Mr. Russell. He's standing outside and he's holding this big crucifix and all the people are behind him. And then they come into the main part of the manto and they go to a large wall and the priest then, all the people have gathered in the area, have gathered around the priest. He's, he's, someone brings out a table and the priest stands up on the table and he addresses the, the congregation, the people gathered around him. And he says, good people of this area, we cleanse this area for you. We want you to keep it clean for future generations. So when he's finished speaking, Frank, he gets down off the table. Frank Duff gets up on the table and he says, can somebody get me a chair as well? So somebody hands him a chair and he stands up on top of the chair. He's at a big wall. He takes out a hammer and a spike and he drives the spike into the back wall and they, hung, they hang the crucifix on the wall as the solemn taking the manto back for the community, for the people. Welcome back to us once again. Good to have your company with us. We continue our story, a marvellous story it is, uh, Miracles on Tap, this wonderful book put together by Frank Duff. It consists of a, a number of chapters which originally were articles that he wrote for the Legion of Mary magazine, the Maria Legionis, and uh, published in serial form, telling the story from start to finish of how Frank Duff tackled, first of all, came across the difficulty of local prostitution, girls in uh, brothels, and very sadly caught into this work as a result of economic necessity. And Frank seeing a great need to reach out and to bring these poor afflicted girls and all the associated work around them uh, to transformation, to conversion, to healing. The, the major turning point in his life was when he read the True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis Marie de Montfort. And that revolutionized his thinking and his life. And in 1917, then, he encounters de Montfort and de Montfort's spirituality, the True Devotion to Mary. So he discovers the True Devotion to Mary, and there's a group of women there who weren't involved in the St. Vincent de Paul because that was reserved for men, but they were involved in the Pioneer Association. They were involved in educating and catechizing children in a kind of a loosely organized way in the local house, Nicholas of Myra house there uh, in Francis Street in Dublin. And some of the women just suggested, they'd heard him speak about de Montfort, they said, well, can we do some of the work that the St. Vincent de Paul are doing? And he said, well, let's have a meeting and let's, let's see how it goes. And everything just sort of fell into place on that September the 7th, 1921, when they gathered, uh, just 15 of them, I think 13 women, Father Michael Toher, the local priest, curate, and Frank Duff, and somebody set up a, a Legion of Mary altar with a cloth. That, well, it wasn't a Legion of Mary altar, it was just a cloth and candles, flowers, and a statue of Our Lady. And uh, they just knelt to pray the rosary, and they started. I had been thinking and thinking and thinking over the name. And there is in my room at home a very beautiful picture of Our Lady. And I stood in front of that, looking at her, and into my mind came the Legion of Mary. And from that very humble beginning, on the 7th of September, 1921, the Legion of Mary today has reached almost every country in the world. The 
want uh, God's kingdom to spread, then we're going to call ourselves after this army, who's the most powerful army, and we're going to not use bullets, not use guns, uh, not use missiles. We're going to use our faith, you know? We're going to approach people with gentleness. We're going to approach them uh, sincerely, you know, respectfully, humbly. And that's the way that the legionaries, you know, the, the soldiers of Mary work. In 1921, a little group of people gathered together and had a meeting, and that was the beginning of the Legion of Mary. This is the, the accelerated growth of Frank Duff, from an ordinary lay person in the pew to engaging with prayer, apostolic work, and then taking on the impossible. And, and this is a key ingredient of the Legion of Mary and its spirituality and its approach to the apostolate, what Frank Duff calls himself symbolic action. So you see an impossible task, a red light district, I don't know, you know, a place full of gangland crime, a place ridden with poverty or destitution, whatever the, the intractable problem might be. He says, you look on that and you look on it in faith and then you take your first small step, you do something, symbolic action, and with grace then, and, and cooperating with God's will and being open to the Spirit, the next step will suggest itself. And little by little, this mountain, you know, can be moved in faith. Imagine a woman who had so many children that she didn't know what to do. And she had a son or daughter who went around every day saying what a wonderful mother he or she had. but they never lifted a hand to help her. And he said, could you say that that son or daughter was truly devoted to their mother? Surely not. That in order, if you're truly devoted, devoted to Mary, then you lend her your hands and your help in her mother work. And Mary's work is to, she labours in forming Christ within us. And she wants to give us birth into eternal life with God one day. Frank saw the Legion of Mary as a way of trying to be truly devoted to Our Lady. Not just saying Hail Mary's, but actually putting your walking the walk. Through devotion to Mary, we come to Jesus through Mary. No Mary, no Jesus. No Jesus, no redemption. That God comes into the world in and through Mary, and he continues to come into the world in and through Mary. And so, one of his apostolic principles was the role of Mary in the apostolate, in the work of redemption, in our own lives, that God chose this way. He could have chosen other ways, but he chose to bring Jesus into the world. He chose to inaugurate the whole work of redemption in and through Mary, in the heart of Mary first, and in her womb. You know, the inseparability of Jesus and Mary. You can't separate them. In the, not just in time, but in eternity, in God's mind, the incarnation takes place. And Mary is, of course, as the mother of God, absolutely essential in the economy of salvation. That is the riveting idea of the Legion of Mary. He, of course, he studied everything he could about Mary. He saw that Central to Mary was the Holy Spirit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit is the primary agent in all evangelization. 
this connection between Mary and the Holy Spirit as the soul of the apostolate, that God came into the world through this twofold principle of Mary and the Holy Spirit. So that was another central idea in Frank Duff. He felt that true devotion to Mary was the key. It was like someone who wanted to walk underwater. You cannot do it without oxygen. And the same way if you want to bring people to Jesus, you cannot do it without the grace of God coming through Our Lady. Union with Mary was the key. Well, Frank Duff had a great awareness of the good that everyone can do within the church, that everyone has a role to play. And each one of us has, we've all been given our own gifts and talents and whatever it is we can offer, once we use that for the good of the church, our Blessed Lady will, will, will take our gifts and talents and, and use them. It's a universal call. All the baptised are asked to participate and, and to, to do what they can. Once we are prepared to give ourselves to Our Lady in all humility and trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit, um, well then God will do great work through us. And this is something that Frank Duff was aware of and, and he used the Legion system to give everyone an opportunity to do their bit for the, for the building up of, of Christ's mystery body. If you love someone, you will work for them, you will act for them, you will be involved actively with their lives. So true devotion to Mary, it's not just saying prayers, it's not an admiration society that the Legion is, it's loving Mary with your sleeves rolled up, helping her in the whole work of bringing Jesus to people. Some people ask, is the Legion of Mary Christocentric enough? Is it not just a Marian movement? The heart of the Legion is Christ and his heart pulsating for each one of us out of love. Love for the addict who the Legion will visit in the detox centre. Love for the homeless who the Legion will visit in the hostel, love for the upset and the wounded who the Legion will meet in the prisons, love for the broken, the dispirited, whom the Legion will meet in their homes and house visitation. I never met Frank Duff, but I've met people who have been deeply immersed in the life of the Legion of Mary. It was Frank Duff, through his writings, through his work, deep in her commitment to Christ. Well, the Legion of Mary is unique in some sense in that it, it enlists the baptismal calling of all the faithful. Mm -hmm. Frank Duff sees it as really the quintessence or the essential, the, the sort of fulfillment of all that it means to be a Catholic. He spoke of not average Catholicism, saying your prayers and going to church, but what he called normal Catholicism, which, which means normal Catholicism being a fully engaged Catholic, uh, whether lay or religious, doesn't matter, but fulfilling their vocation to the full in following the Lord's command to go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. So to being apostolic, but where you are. And so the Legion of Mary, it seeks to uh, gather together in a structured way each week, ordinary baptized lay men and women to energize them in the work of evangelization, to reach out to their neighbor in whatever way, but to proclaim the gospel, to preach the faith, to go and speak to somebody else about the faith. Our faith has to form our actions. And Frank Duff understood that um, that members of the Legion of Mary, that their faith is not just something that, that they put into practice maybe one or two hours a week, but it's a whole way of life, a whole way of living, a whole way of looking at the world, and a whole way of interacting with people, recognizing their true dignity made in the image and likeness of God. So our faith should impact our relationships with everyone, uh, with God and neighbor, and, and with ourselves.
um, you know, the primary aim of the Legion of Mary is the sanctification of our own souls, so that uh, our faith is, is, is um, renewing the face of the earth through our interaction with our neighbour and uh, our, our own love for the Lord, that we're being transformed ourselves by this. And this in turn then is, is bringing down graces to the rest of the world. My name is Michael Fitzpatrick, and uh, I'm a member of the Legion of Mary. Uh, well, what transformed my life uh, regarding personal sanctification was the book I read that Frank wrote, uh, Can We Be Saints? And uh, he explained in his one sentence I thought was very good. He said, to be a saint, you must do the ordinary things extraordinary well. I felt that was marvellous. I felt that it was achievable to become a saint. As he said, if you do the ordinary things extraordinary well. Pope Francis often talks. He wants to see saints with torn jeans and maybe holding, eating a Big Mac. In other words, ordinary people drinking a Diet Coke. Ordinary people living today's world, but ordinary people who are extraordinary. Can we be saints? That's our challenge. Not just to the wonderful members of the Legion of Mary all over our country, all over our world, in many parts of our world, but to every baptized person. Can we be a saint? Through the Legion of Mary, I think my interior life was developed. I think that the Legion has, as its uh, primary focus, the personal, the sanctification of its members and the glory of God. And the handbook you can say, of the Legion of Mary, you can say it's a collection of rules and it's very long. It's, uh, you know, so many hundreds of pages. But Frank Tuff really emphasizes at one point in the handbook that if you don't have the spirit of the Legion, which is the spirit of Mary, which is the spirit that filled Mary on the day of the Annunciation, which is God's Holy Spirit, if you're not filled with this Holy Spirit, then you're not going to be able to, to live as a legionary. You're not going to be able to live out uh, what God is calling you to do. So I think you, you, we need to have this spirituality the Legion that was known at a global level by the 1960s when the Second Vatican Council began um, and, you know, had already proven itself through the likes of Venerable Ida Quinn in Africa, who gave the last eight years of her life as a lay woman, traveling, you know, around East Africa, Mauritius and South Africa evangelizing and, and achieving success with missionary work and lay involvement where missionaries had failed for years in bringing different nationalities together. For instance, in, she succeeded in um, Nairobi in bringing the local Africans, the Asian community and the British the colonial community together, the faithful, to work together in the Legion of Mary. Whereas the missionaries were kind of dealing with this, these ethnic sort of tensions all the time, it you know, and the Legion succeeded in doing these things. Another interesting element of the story, um, uh, Monsignor Ribéry, who was the papal nuncio to West Africa, had heard about the work of Edel Quinn in East Africa. He was then appointed in 1947 as papal internuncio to China, just as communism was beginning to take over after the Second World War. And um, he sought to establish the Legion of Mary in China ahead of communist occupation in order that the church would hold fast after the communist takeover. And there are thousands of Legion of Mary martyrs in China. It's another huge chapter of the history of the Legion, which is almost untold. communist revolution in China, the national newspaper, the People's Daily, which was the newspaper of the communist government in China, uh, in, in the days, the early days of the communist revolution, published a front page, uh, a, a, a front page article, Legion of Mary, public enemy number one. Why would they say that? 
if only only because uh, its its methods, its way, everything about it was so effective. If we're going to talk about the fruits of the Legion as a sign of God's presence in the Legion, God's providence with the Legion, one of the great fruits of the Legion Mary is the vocations, vocations to the priesthood and vocations to religious life. It's just unbelievable the number of vocations that have been nurtured in the Legion. Whatever it is about the Legion's apostolic work, it seems to be perfect grounding for vocations. Frank Duff himself said in one of his articles that the Legion on its own could solve the vocations problem in the world today. The three most recent members to enter this monastery, myself and Sister Neve and Sister Cathy, we all were members of the Legion of Mary. We all were influenced by Frank's thought, by his writings, by how he thinks our life should be lived. And I think the, the Legion of Mary helps a lot with vocations because of the way it helps. It encourages you to live your life. So Saint, um, Frank Duff wrote a little booklet called We Can Be Saints. It's a little tiny booklet that I read it when I was a teenager. And in that, he encourages everyone to, to live their life and in, in the ordinary everyday events of their life, to, to just turn to God and ask, what's your will in this situation? Frank Duff, who started the, the devotion or the practice of uh, Legion of Mary. And uh, he was, uh, that, that practice was uh, quite strong uh, in, the, in, in our land, in the country, Sri Lanka. And uh, probably because of uh, that sort of devotion to Mother Mary and to the, uh, to the practice that we had for the Legion of Mary, I took the decision to join the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, where the Mary is concerned. Uh, so as I was uh, in the seminary, uh, I still can remember we every week, every Saturday, we had uh, a, 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 a meeting for the Legion of Mary. Well, I could say without a shadow of a doubt, I wouldn't be a priest today if it wasn't for the Legion of Mary. I joined the Legion of Mary back in 2002. Um, I was 22 years of age at the time, I think. And um, up until that point, I had been somewhat lukewarm in my faith. I'd always been Catholic and was raised Catholic and went to a Catholic school and made all the sacraments. But really not until I joined the Legion of Mary did my faith really come alive. Um, and then the more I learned about the Legion, the more I learned about our Catholic faith, the more I was um, inspired to learn more about this, the founder, the man who began the Legion of Mary, and began reading about Frank Duff and the great work he did. Many men, women, and families are filled with anxiety and weighted down by troubles. The entire world longs for peace, but where do we find it? The unrest in society is an outcome of the lack of peace within families. The unrest within families is due to the lack of peace in individual hearts. True peace can be found only in Christ. Shalom World embraces and shares the peace of Christ to individuals and families by broadcasting programs that reach millions of viewers worldwide. Being faithful to the Catholic Church, Shalom World will communicate the truth, goodness, and beauty of life with Christ and His Church. Shalom World brings to the forefront missionary activities from across the globe, encouraging and inspiring viewers to support the missions. The programs highlight the many rights, ministries, and movements within the Catholic Church, recognizing the unity and diversity that makes us one body in Christ. Shalom World broadcasts programs which highlight the charisms of the Holy Spirit at work in a multitude of different ministries and church organizations. Shalom World is a family channel broadcasting a wide range of programming, exploring the Catholic faith for all ages. first commercial-free Catholic charismatic channel. Faith-filled, 
virtue-building, character-based, family-friendly television with Shalom. Be strengthening the faith of so many people in our homes. I want to give my blessing to, uh, to the work and labors and activities of uh, Shalom. Through this media, we will be able to continue to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To promote the gift of church teaching to all of us who are young at heart. A Catholic media ministry that has made wonderful contributions to the church over the past 10 years. Dedicated for the new evangelization and address to the young people. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 The broadcast ministry that prays for its viewers. Shalom World, God's own channel. Talking about the fruit, it has produced lay saints as well. It's not just vocations as a priesthood. And two of the legionaries already, their causes have been introduced. Great Adel Quinn, a lay missionary in Africa, Alfie Lamb, whose cause is also introduced. Adel is, is already a venerable, and Alfie's cause is going very well. Two lay missionaries, lay legionaries. So it produces not just priests and nuns, and, but really deeply committed lay people, family people. Paul VI said to Frank, and it was one of the things he cherished most in his life. Paul VI said of the Legion of Mary, what I like most about the Legion of Mary is that it empowers the little people to become apostles. That's what the Legion has done. People who had never dreamed that they could be apostolic or even what the word meant. The Legion enabled them to be apostolic and that gave Frank such joy. Frank Tuff attended the Vatican, Second Vatican Council. Invited for the last 97 days of the Second Vatican Council and was there for the closing of the Vatican Council. I met with Pope Paul VI as well. When he was, when Cardinal Heenan spotted him coming into the aula of St. Peter's, he mentioned his name and who he was to the bishops and they gave him a standing ovation for five minutes. And thanks for the work he has done for the church. Because they were discussing the lay apostolate, and who better than a lay person who has actually done something, and not just talked about it. You know, so that was the approbation of the whole council, you know, and I think that was a powerful affirmation. The laity have a huge role, a role which has been emphasized by Vatican II documents. Christopher Dalis Lecce, Evangelium Gaudium of Pope Francis, many talk about the role of lay people in helping our faith. Frank Duff was an inspiration to many of us. And I think he would, in going to the Vatican Council and speaking about the Legion and getting an applause from all the delegates all over the world was a great moment for him. But again, he'd say, not about me, it's about the message. It's about Christ, going to Christ through Our Lady. She's the mediatrix, she's the one who's nudging him like at the wedding feast at Cana. Do whatever he tells you. Turn the water jars into wine. Today, Frank Duff is saying to Lady, listen to Our Lady. Get close to Our Lord. Roll up your sleeves. Get dug in to parish life. Then he had a sense of eternity. Like, uh, as I said elsewhere, um, his big question was, where are people going to spend eternity? 
and he wanted everybody to spend eternity with God. That was the central theme of his life. I often call him like the Mother Teresa of Dublin, given the thousands that have been through the two hostels which are nearest here where we're recording this. Tens of thousands of people have passed through the doors of those two hostels. You know, huge numbers of people and just driven by this compassion, deep compassion, love for the poor and the vulnerable, drug addicts, uh, um, psychiatric patients, uh, alcoholics, all, you know, homeless, all kinds of problems. And Frank met all of these head on from the beginning and was sort of driven by the, the desperate need of so many people. Uh, I, I come from a family of eight. There's four boys and four girls in my family. And there was, fate wasn't practiced. We were all baptized and made our confirmation, but uh, the fate wasn't practiced at home at all. Through, through difficult life circumstances, I suppose uh, I had to seek refuge. Through some difficult life circumstances, I had nowhere else to go. So I, I went, and two friends brought me to the Regina Chaley Hostel in Dublin. And this is a hostel run by the Legion of Mary. And uh, I was welcomed here with open arms. I mean, I had no faith. I was in a very bad place myself. Um, and I remember going in and being um, um, interviewed by the sister. She in, in, interviewed me and she gave me um, a picture of Frank Duff, who I've never heard of, and a um, miraculous medal. I didn't realise that this was going to be a big turning point in my life. So that's how I came from being Cathy to Sister Cathy. Uh, Frank Duff first in 1969 when I was uh, an indoor brother in the Morning Star Hostel and I was introduced to him by brother Sid Quinn. Uh, we had a small problem in the hostel and uh, uh, Mr Duff resolved it very quickly. And then next I, I went to holidays with him on a cycling trip to Donegal. And uh, a wonderful time there for eight days, a uh, party of legionaries, ten legionaries. And uh, in the evening time, uh, he'd always regale us with stories of the early days of the Legion. And we were just fascinated by him, you know. Uh, he was just a mine of information. And uh, behind it all, a very deep spirituality. As I was saying, one of the hobbies he had was cycling. And he cycled all over Ireland. And even the year he died, at the age of 91, he was still cycling. Not on the long trips, but shorter trips. But he wasn't really able towards the end. And one day, the, the day he actually died, uh, he went to two masses, because he daily mass called communion. On the day he died, uh, it, it was the funeral of Joan Cronin. She, she did so very much work as an envoy of the Legion. The funeral was on this day, and Frank went to the funeral. He came home, and he said to his housekeeper, I'm not feeling well. I won't take any lunch. Maybe later on, bring me a cup of tea or something. Anyway, when she went back, whatever the thing, he was dead. But his head was slightly up, his eyes were open, and he was looking at a picture of, the, a very large picture of the Sacred Heart. In front of the bed is the picture of the Sacred Heart. And Frank had a lifelong devotion to the Sacred Heart. To God's personal, profound, passionate love for him, so the first thing he saw every morning of his life was the picture of the Sacred Heart. And the last thing he saw on this earth was the picture of the Sacred Heart. He, lived, he looked so peaceful in death. November 1980, I was 
staying for the weekend just outside Mullingar at a farmhouse that we brought the children to for so many years. And I switched on the nine o'clock news. You know, the phone rang and Kieran told me that Frank Duff had died. And I switched on the nine o'clock news and I remember clearly towards the end of the bulletin, they announced uh, Steve McQueen, the movie actor, had died. And practically the last item after Steve McQueen was the death had taken place of Frank Duff. So I was leaving Mullingar the next day and I stopped off at the Regina Chaley. And there was a queue of people going up the road. And I went into the chapel and Frank Duff was laid out in a coffin. Constant stream up this avenue. Constant stream. Just non-stop people coming. Then uh, Charles Hyde, who was the tea, what we call the tea shop, because the Prime Minister at the time, decided to make it a kind of a state funeral. I think all the bishops of Ireland were present, many, many priests. The procession from the church to the grave to Glasnevin Cemetery, all along the road. It was a, a massive day. You know, most of the people were very ordinary people. It was the little people again who wanted to make that last farewell to a great man. The devotion to people, people wanting to have something touch his, his body as a relic or a rosary or something. And they all wanted just to touch the coffin. And it was amazing. But looking back, the voice of the people, what we call the Vox Populi, that day was loud and loud and clear about the character and the life of this man who was buried in Glass Nevin. At the funeral mass, Cardinal Fee said that he would be known as the Irish man of the century. My own conviction is he won't be just the Irish man of the century. He'd be the Irish man for many centuries, since perhaps the time of St. Patrick. When uh, Frank Duff was nearing the end of his life, many of the people who knew him knew that, uh, in a way, this was the, this was the key person in the, in the organization of the Legion of Mary, which had spread to over 100 countries in his lifetime. And they were worried, what's going to happen after, after you go? How, how is this going to go on? And Frank Duff's reassurance and his words were always, this isn't my Legion of Mary, this is Mary's. This is the Legion of Mary. It's, so we have to trust that that this uh, way of living your life, this way of dependence on Mary and, and do, you know, being her hands and feet in the world to, to practically go out to extend the reach of the church, that, that that's the, this is his legacy. If you want to describe his legacy, it would be the mobilization of the laity. Back in 1921, 100 years ago, who were the laity? I mean, in the 19th century, Bishop Ullathorne asked Newman, the Bishop of Birmingham, when Newman was writing about the laity, he said to Newman, who are the laity? And Newman said, well, the church would look funny without them. But the, the old thing was to pray and to pay. They weren't to engage in the apostolate. Whereas Frank Duff mobilized the ordinary people. Is Frank Duff a saint? I would change the question, would Frank Duff want to be a saint? He wouldn't. I believe he would want to be an influence on all of us, to get closer to the Lord. He wouldn't be interested in sainthood for, for the sake of people saying, because sometimes when somebody is made a saint, we forget about them. We no longer intercede to them because it's far better that they're on the road, they're venerable, they're, they're remembered, we're interceding for them, we're, we're, we're processing with them, we're pilgriming, pilgriming with them. 
Would Frank Duff want to be saint? I don't know. Is he a saint? He certainly is because of his wonderful example. Would he want it? I'm not sure. It's interesting. When he made First Communion, the priest said, what do you want to do when you grow up? We were all asked those questions. What did Frank Duff answer? I want to be a priest. In my opinion, it would be a huge mistake for Frank Duff to become a priest. He was a much more effective layman, civil servant, author, reflective thinker, reaching out to the margins, to the broken, to the wounded. Frank Duff did things he could never do as a priest. Frank Duff achieved things he could never achieve as a priest. So you ask about, and we wonder, would he be a saint? I would repeat the question. Of course I think he's a saint, but I'm not certain he would want to be a saint. He would want to be an example to all of us to get closer to Christ. Why do I believe he's a saint? First of all, his love of the poor, the dignity of people. Every human person he saw, he saw Christ. Long before Mother Teresa of Calcutta and all these great saints of modern times, Frank Duff, as a member of the Vincent de Paul, basic principle of his life as regards human beings like you and me, is that he sees Christ in them. Whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me. One of the men I interviewed in the course of the process for his beatification was a man from the Morning Star Hostel for down and out. People, people who couldn't cope with life. He'd been an alcoholic and um, recovered and was happily married. Frank Duff was the best man at his wedding. And I interviewed him and I said to him, what was the thing that most impressed you about Frank Duff? And he said to me, Father, when I was an alcoholic and down and out on the streets, and I met Mr. Duff, I discovered that he was the only man that ever looked up to me. His reverence for me was extraordinary. And this homeless man said, you know, Frank Duff, the only man who ever looked up to me. So it's a nice, simple phrase, but that Frank Duff had this way of serving the poor, either poor in spirit or poor in body, l looking up to them. And that's a legion, it's a Catholic thing too. It's, it's, I've come not to be served, but to serve. So it's simply filling out our Catholic faith. And I think that's the story of his life. Do you know, he's one of these great saints like Mother Teresa, who really did believe, not as a theory, not just as an intellectual conviction, but in practice, he believed in the presence of Jesus, not only in the Eucharist, but in every human being he met. People would write to him from, from all corners of the world, explaining their difficulties and looking for advice and various things. And uh, he would spend hours every night writing back to people. And he would always remember what was going on in their lives. Even though he was dealing with people all over the world in so many different circumstances, uh, he always remembered uh, each person and what they were going through, what their difficulties were, and, and also the good things. You know, he, he just had a genuine interest and awareness of people and, and their lives. That for me, in a word, in a few words, is Frank Duff, a man who discovered Mary as his mother, and through her and with her came to give primacy to Jesus, to the Holy Trinity. That's his spirituality, and out of that spirituality came all the marvelous works in the apostolate. His life is a challenge. It challenges us to live, live out our faith, and it, perhaps it sets an ideal, and I think I, I make the comparison between Frank Duff and St. Paul, as in we read the writings of St. Paul and he's always exhorting us, you know, encouraging us to, to, to higher things, to greater things, to, to more zeal in our lives. We have to see Jesus in each person that we meet. And he emphasizes that again and again. I think he was a man deeply in love with our Blessed Mother and uh, a man who totally was totally committed to building up the, the good of the church. And, and even throughout his life, he did heroic things. He did miraculous things. The Lord worked miracles through Frank Duff. 
And uh, even the Legion itself, I think, is a testament to, to, to what a great man he was, what a great saint he was. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that someday the church will acknowledge him as a, as, a, as a great saint and certainly one of the greatest Irish saints. I think Frank Duff is a saint partly because he lived the Legion. The mission, the vision he had for the Legion of Mary was as a group that would form Catholics to be saints. How you live continually responding to God, how you live continually loving your neighbour, like seeing Christ in everyone you meet. It was a very strong impression made on me that this was a truly holy man. Frank Duff was a layman. Frank Duff was everyone's father, grandfather, uncle, friend. He had that fatherly figure. The image of Frank Duff is spectacular. And there's a particular image, which I love, of showing the fatherly figure reaching out. Does that man want to be a saint? Not at all. Does he want to change the church? Absolutely. Where will you spend eternity? He wanted everybody to spend eternity with God. When I'm called before the Lord, he said, and I'm asked to give an account of myself, he said, I don't think I'll say that I said the divine office every day or that I was at mass every day, sometimes twice a day. But he said, I will say that I risked everything for your sake. So I think courage, if you want one word. He's a very gentle man, very humble man, and um, great humanity as well as spirituality. He saw his vocation to be a co-redeemer. He was a man of, um, of commitment, of loyalty, of dignity, and simplicity, and a man of faith. Frank Duff like, was a man that lived the spirit of the gospel in many ways. Frank Duff was an apostle. Most extraordinary man. His heroic faith and uh, the genuine love he had for God and love for neighbour, I would say a saint. He was a man of vision. The fruits of the Legion were conversions, the validation of marriages, catechetical work, uh, everything, work with prostitutes, with homosexuals, with all classes of society. It's, it's tremendous, and it all started with this little man, you know, who lived most of his life in one small square mile of Dublin. And he has influenced the whole world. So it's a glorious life. This wonderful Dublin citizen traveled back and forth indeed in his wonderful work. Founding the Legion of Mary on the 7th of September in 1921, soon celebrating 100 years, and died on the 7th of November in 1980. The 1st of November, of course, which we're celebrating today, the Feast of All Saints. 6th of November, the Feast of All the Saints of Ireland. And please God, the 7th of November will become known as a celebratory day for this particular saint in waiting, our friend and dear comrade in eternal life and did such great work for the poor here in this world and still influencing us to this day, none other than Frank Duff. Are you looking for life-changing entertainment? Does what you see on most channels leave you feeling unfulfilled? Well, look no further. Shalom World TV brings the peace and joy of Jesus Christ to you, whether at home or on the go. To start watching, you don't need antennas, cable connections, or a dish. You probably already have what you need, if you have a smart TV, such as a Samsung, LG, or Panasonic, or if you have them with an Android, Opera, or Roku TV operating system. These can be found on the latest models of Sony, Toshiba, Vizio, Philips, RCA, Sharp Aquos, TCL, Insignia, Element, Hitachi, Vestal, Skyworth, Chang Hong, Konka, and Hisense. You can also watch Shalom TV on most IPTV streaming devices, starting with the fourth generation of Apple TV and Roku, Amazon Fire TV, 
Me Box, Amino, Humax, or on TiVo Box through the Opera TV store. Are you a gamer or virtual reality enthusiast? We've got you covered. Shalom World is on Xbox One, Razer Forge, Nvidia Shield, and HoloLens. To start watching, all you have to do is go to the App Store, download Shalom World, and start being fulfilled by content that brings you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. For more information on how to watch Shalom World on your TVs and devices, visit us at shalomworld.org slash connected TV. Have a smartphone or tablet? Take Shalom with you wherever you go. Again, by downloading Shalom World from the App Store. If you prefer to watch from your Mac or PC, get the Shalom World desktop app. Or you can always watch from our website, shalomworld.org. And guess what? Shalom World is absolutely free on all of these platforms. Yes, free. There are no download charges and no in-store app purchases required, ever. If you're looking for life-changing entertainment, you found it. It's here, waiting for you on your Shalom World.